Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Anton Levy. I'm the co-president and chairman of our technology group at General Atlantic. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we're a leading global growth equity firm. We've got just shy of about $100 billion of AUM. And um, what we do basically since 1980, we've been investing and working with visionary founders and companies to lead transformative businesses. Um, over our 44-year history, we've invested over $60 billion in over 520 companies across multiple stages of growth. Today, I'm honored to be joined by the CEO of one of those companies, one of our best CEOs, Tom Weiss, who leads Sierra Space, uh, a highly innovative space technology and services company focused on next generation space planes, space stations, and critical space subsystems and infrastructure. Tom joined Sierra Space in 2021, following the company's spin out of Sierra Nevada Corporation, a leading global aerospace and national security company. Tom has an extensive career in aerospace, including the CEO of Arian Corporation, and before that, uh, among many other things, president of Northrop Grumman's aerospace systems uh, sector. Um, Sierra Space is over, uh, has built over 4,000 space subsystems components, uh, run over 500 missions, and um, including 14 trips to Mars. Um, GA, just as background, led Sierra's $1.4 billion uh, Series A uh, investment in November of 2021. Tom, thank you very much for being thank here. Uh, thank we're you. really excited. Um, so just to kick off the discussion, um, uh, space, uh, Tom has said in op-eds and just came out with a book two weeks ago. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, but Tom has uh, talked about the impact of space being bigger than electricity, steam power, and the internet in terms of its impact on humanity. Um, going uh, in the, this next phase from just a handful of astronauts in space to thousands of people in space uh, doing many different uh, activities. We're gonna hear a lot about that. Uh, but, but just to jump in, uh, in terms of today, lots of news this week uh, about uh, national security, about defense, uh, lots of questions around the U.S., Russia, China, uh, ambitions in space. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what your views of that are, uh, how the world is changing, how you think about defending space, yeah. uh, and that whole sub-area that I know is on a lot of people's minds yeah. this week in particular? Well, you jumped in with a hard one there. Thank you. Um, it's my job. You know, the, the first thing I, I'd say is, that, you know, what we're focused on at CR Space is to build out a business and technology platform that can really drive the new space economy. So therefore, our company spends an enormous amount of, of our time, ingenuity, technology, to make sure that we defend space. Uh, we, pr we provide systems that give our nation and our allies overmatched capability to ensure that space is free, things that are, are in space to do harm in space and things on the ground, the terrestrial uh, targets or terrestrial missions or terrestrial missiles or, or defense capability that can actually get to space and then harm space. So, you know, if we just think about uh, space uh, was a, a sanctuary domain. Uh, it wasn't that many decades ago where we'd put something up on orbit and, uh, and you didn't have to worry about it much. Uh, those days are completely over. Um, this is a day in which space is a domain just like every other. Uh, same as underwater, same as surface, same as land, where adversaries are uh, really very aggressive in terms of holding the U.S. at some kind of position where our freedom of action uh, isn't guaranteed. Uh, space is no longer a sanctuary domain, it is a warfighting domain. So our company is very focused on developing technologies associated with ensuring that the assets we have in space um, are protected, uh, that the systems that we provide uh, our women and men in uniform and our allies, again, uh, make sure that we can provide the capability for the U.S. to defend and to offensively do the kinds of missions that are important to us. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about this problem. We have been investing uh, quite some time. You know, one of the concerns I have is that the adversaries around the world are more aggressive now than they've been at least uh, in, in the last 10, 15 years, you see conflicts around the world, while at the same time you see the CEO of some of, of, some of the major aerospace and defense companies talking about, you know, they're pushing back on 
uh, defense acquisitions that are meant to put uh, capability in the hands of our warfighters faster. Uh, you see them talking about potentially not bidding on things or participating in acquisitions. At Sierra Space, we think of it very differently. We are a high-tech, high-speed innovator that's very focused on bringing capability very quickly. We provide the ability to do very tight coupled between AI-enabled software and hardware uh, that allows uh, mechanisms, systems in space to be very adaptive to the threat. Um, we've talked a lot about large language models. We use LLMs, we use CNNs uh, very effectively to think about what is the adversary's next step and then to block that step. Uh, just in the last eight months alone, executing this strategy, we've been awarded $1.3 billion in, in new satellite constellations uh, in the area of things like uh, missile classification, missile detection, missile warning, missile tracking, and fire control. Um, and it shows that uh, Sierra Space is, in fact, a next generation defense tech prime in the area of protecting space. Again, protecting space from other space assets and clearly protecting space from terrestrial uh, things that want to do harm to in-space assets. So that's the focus we have. But again, it's in the context of uh, we're building out a new space economy and we, we, we invest a tremendous amount of technology into creating space planes, space stations, next generation rocket engines. Uh, that same technology, that same underpinning, uh, we now apply to national security and defense tech. So we're both a high tech space tech company and a defense tech company but uh, we really get to leverage a single investment to feed both of those different verticals. Shifting topics, because we don't have that much time, let's talk about the International Space Station. It's winding down uh, at the end of this decade, and you've come out very publicly and talked about how important it is for the U.S. to lead this next phase of innovation and why it's important to democracy. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, we're really excited about this. If we think about, we're transitioning from 60 years of, of space exploration to the full commercialization of low Earth orbit. Um, you know, low Earth orbit is just 250 miles above our head. Uh, it's about the distance between here and Orlando. But what you can do in low Earth orbit, uh, taking advantage of foundational tech that underpins microgravity, is that you can actually create an entire new field of products in biotech, industrial tech, in clean energy. Um, the, the way that we are thinking about the, the, the disruption to terrestrial markets from our space stations in low Earth orbit, uh, it, this market is huge. It will drive GDP. I always think about the next magnificent seven, 10 years from now, will be companies with a significant footprint in space. Um, we already know we've run thousands of experiments on the International Space Station. This is not science fiction, it's science fact. Uh, we can produce new novel drugs in oncology. We're producing drugs today that have impacts on longevity. We're, we're, we're focused on uh, crystallization of materials that will affect uh, uh, glass, semiconductors, uh, and, and uh, the focus we have in terms of really getting after clean new sources of energy and battery technology. We can do this in space. It's 250 miles above our head. Uh, and the focus we have is actually driving the price down so significantly that the board of directors and the biotech companies, industrial companies, will see space now as their next frontier to develop the next big, big products. Um, why the U.S. must lead this, and I'll, I'll think about it in terms of the, the way that the U.S. and our allies and our partners around the world think of the, the economic model that we enjoy versus the economic model that maybe the Chinese enjoy, is that there, there is a space race going on. It's not only a space race in terms of national security, but one around economic security. These markets are huge. In fact, the four markets that we're focused on initially that our space station will service is three in biotech and one industrial glass. In 2022, terrestrial, uh, the terrestrial markets were 900 billion. They're growing at uh, a little over 8% CAGR to 3.7 trillion by 2038. Uh, and we intend to disrupt about two or 3% of that terrestrial market just in the first space station. Uh, but what we did was invent technology that allows us to put up space stations, reinvent the space station. So we can put up a space station that's one-third the size of the entire ISS and now a single launch. It took 40 launches to put up the ISS. We could put up the ISS now in three. If we think about that same technology in a SpaceX Starship, right, using the same technology we have available today, we could put up a space station six times larger than either the Starship itself 
or the ISS. Again, what we're doing is something similar to what SpaceX did. SpaceX drove the cost per pound to orbit down significantly with things like Falcon 9 and Falcon 9 Heavy. We're doing the same thing by taking the cost per cubic meter down of operating space and driving that down significantly, again, to allow the next big breakthrough products to happen in space. Uh, super exciting. Um, going to shift topics again a little yep. bit. Dream Chaser. Uh, this is one of the company's uh, key initiatives and products. First of all, for this audience, can you talk about what is yeah. Dream Chaser? And then after that, maybe talk about a little bit about what it's going to enable uh, and a little bit of how you're thinking yeah. about the time frame. So Dream Chaser is a, a really innovative, uh, revolutionary commercial space plane um, that takes advantage of the entire worldwide airline runway infrastructure. Uh, we utilize fuels on board that aren't, aren't toxic or hazardous, so you can walk up to the vehicle directly after it lands, after it cools down. Um, and so we can take advantage of any runway a 737 MAX can go into or an A321neo can go into. Again, it's revolutionary. So we can bring cargo and people back and land at a runway uh, that, again, we're not just creating the first space plane, we're actually creating the first space line. If you think about it, for 60 years, everything coming back from space today is still plunged into an ocean, just like the Mercury program, uh, the Apollo program. Uh, we thought this, we rethought entirely how to redo this. So we reinvented the space transportation network, and the way that we built it was to connect to the infrastructure already available on the ground, which are runways. Um, so that gives us now the opportunity, obviously, we take off, our first flight will take off from Kennedy Space Center this year, service the International Space Station uh, with uh, 11,000 pounds of cargo, come back and land at Kennedy Space Center. But we're working with companies uh, in, in, in Tokyo, so we can take off in Tokyo, land Orita Airport. Uh, we're doing the same thing in Europe. Uh, we're focused on doing the same thing in the Middle East. Uh, we can already land in Huntsville, Alabama, and New Mexico. This is the advantage of having a space plane and a space line instead of taking a capsule and plunging it back into an ocean for a salt bath. Uh, we just think differently about this. We think differently about reinventing the space station as well. And so the space plane and the space station, what we call is an integrated platform that actually drives the economics. And the reason why we want to drive the economics is we're after terrestrial markets in biotech and industrial tech. That's the whole premise of the company. Super exciting. Um, again, just in the interest of time to touch on a number of different important topics. Let's talk about NASA. NASA, how they procure and how they uh, commercialize um, the various projects. It's changed a lot with the private markets. Can, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what's going on at NASA, what's changed, and how you see the next decade uh, playing out? Yeah, I, first of all, I always have to say you know, I'm a product of, of NASA. Uh, as a young kid watching uh, Apollo launches and, and NASA putting human beings on the surface of the moon, it's, it's what got me to be an engineer in the first place. Uh, and, and right now, NASA is focused on their next big mission, right? They're transitioning off of the International Space Station. We're going to deorbit the ISS uh, at the end of the decade. And NASA and the United States is transitioning low Earth orbit to commercial space companies like Sierra Space. As NASA then thinks about, obviously, the transition to the moon uh, and deeper space missions uh, beyond the moon, as they think about Mars and beyond. So low Earth orbit is, is now going to be the venue of, of commercial space companies. Again, that's what our focus is on low Earth orbit. Um, but we need to think about NASA really did an incredible job building international partnerships. Uh, five space agencies that represent 15 countries are represented in the International Space Station. As we transition from a, a US and, and, and space agency-led uh, coalition on the International Space Station, We've got to think about taking now the responsibility of us in, 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 in low Earth orbit. So we work a lot with not only international uh, agencies today, space agencies around the world, uh, those that are, that are obviously on the ISS today, uh, but our focus is now is growing relationships in the Middle East, growing relationships in India, growing relationships in Africa, growing relationships in Latin America. And again, beyond international space agencies and beyond countries, we're very focused on growing deep relationships with global biotech companies, global industrial tech companies. We now have 50 different MOUs in those two areas alone. And we think this is going to create, again, 
the next generation of international partnerships in low Earth orbit, but they're going to be on commercial space stations, but it's equally as important that international partnership remains. I do believe strongly that space is an element of diplomacy. And so part of what we're trying to do is ensure that we continue to have great economic ties, great country-to-country uh, -country bilateral and multilateral ties, uh, even though it's a commercial space station. It's really important to think about this transition from a government-ran international space station to now a commercial-ran international space station. So, Tom, we have time uh, maybe for one more question here uh, before our time is up. Can, uh, you've talked about space and the next uh, period of space being space for humanity. Um, you've written a book about it, as I alluded to in the introduction, uh, that's come out two weeks ago. Can you talk about for this audience what you like the key takeaways for the book to be um, yeah. and why you wrote the book? You know, we, we see uh, space in almost ele every element now in the arts and the sciences, movies. Uh, we see it uh, and, and just it's all around us. But I don't think anybody's actually done yet a very good job at explaining how each of us uh, will see this new environment, will participate in this new world. It's going to have a profound impact on all of us. I, I write in the book that, uh, you know, for the first time we can actually see a pathway for solving leukemia. Um, every nine minutes, uh, somebody in the United States dies of blood cancer. Um, I, I think about saving the young girl today that we don't have an answer for. Uh, I think about finding new solutions to nanocomputers that will help drive, again, the next wave of AI that may not be produced. I, I've, I've read a lot of foundries in my life. Um, you know, gravity it does have an effect on how you produce things. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's befitting at a conference where we're talking about impact to humanity. The reason why we're building a platform in space is to literally benefit life on Earth. We're not the company that's trying to be, you know, multi-planetary. We're, we're not trying to figure out a way to, to get off the planet. Um, I participated in designing the James Webb Space Telescope during my time at Northrop. Um, it's a telescope that can see back in time 13 and a half billion years. You know, we still have not found life beyond Earth. This is a very special place. Um, and so the focus we have and what we're doing is really try to impact the lives of a billion people at a minimum. I always think of us as we're the billion people company. We don't go to space for the benefit of the few. We go to space for the benefit of the many. And we think that's what's that's profound about what we're doing. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Thank you. This was a great session, and you can see the incredible work that uh, that Tom and Sierra Space is doing uh, for for the planet. So thank you very much. Hey, thank, you. It. thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.